It is now my very good pleasure to introduce Lori Cumbo, who is the director of Mokata in uh, Fort Greene Museum. Good morning. Again, my name is Lori Cumbo, and I'm the founder and executive director of the Museum of Contemporary African Diaspora and Arts. I'm thrilled to be here, and it was such an honor to be invited to present today. I have a, a bit of a, a, a lengthy presentation in terms of my slides, but there was so much that I wanted to share with you that I'm going to try and go through the slides as quickly as possible so that I can get to the meat of some of the things that I really wanted to discuss. I have a... Uh, wealth of information about the museum, which is my baby. Um, I founded the museum 12 years ago as a result of a graduate thesis at NYU. And I spent the two years um, at NYU basically talking about and researching and documenting and finally doing a thesis and a business plan on the ability to create a museum of the African diaspora in Brooklyn, New York. I noticed that, and it was brought to my attention, that Brooklyn, of all the five boroughs in New York City, has the largest concentration of people of African descent. And so that gave me the first uh, bit of knowledge that made me really say, this borough is worthy of a museum, and I'm going to do the research to find out if that can actually happen. Now, once the thesis was over, there was a whole tidal wave that happened that really got me started into the museum and really made this a reality. But I'll go through some of my slides and show you a little bit about the museum and um, some of our exhibitions and things that we've been working on. Oh, there we are. Thank you for that. Um, a little bit about our mission. We were really developed because I believe very strongly that when you look at the African diaspora, which is the dispersal of people of African descent to other parts of the world, through that, a lot of our cultural traditions have been lost. And I really believe that when you have a firm understanding of your culture, which was taken through the transatlantic slave trade, our objective as a museum is to reintroduce as well as to save and preserve a lot of the cultural retentions that we do have. So when I talk about the African diaspora, I'm really talking about the entire population of people that live not only in Africa, but also abroad. And so these are some of the exhibitions that we've done over the years. And I'm just going to give you some highlights of these exhibitions. And they have been, some have been very uh, aesthetically beautiful. Some have been very controversial. And we'll talk about them as we go along. The Middle Passage White Ships Black Cargo was one of our first exhibitions in our space. And it talked about the transatlantic slave trade. Um, an artist named Tom Feelings devoted 20 years of his life traveling the Atlantic slave trade to really go back in time and find out what it must have been like to be an African captured on a slave and what that whole process must have been like from the capturing all the way to the auction block. And it was a very uh, beautiful exhibition, but it was also very disturbing at times as well, too, to think about the history in that way. Um, also talking about in a lot of ways... Uh, the rapes that happened, the beatings that happened, and the number of people that were killed during the transatlantic slave trade as well. We also did an exhibition called the Post-Millennial Black Madonna, um, examining what would it have been like if we had recognized the Virgin Mary to be a woman of African descent. Biblically, when we talk about Jesus and we talk about what Jesus looks like, it would only make sense that the Madonna would be a woman of African descent. And several artists um, took it upon themselves to reimagine what the Virgin Mary would have looked like if depicted in that way. Some did very modern interpretations and some did very uh, contemporary associations. The next exhibition was our French Evolution, which was examining the race riots in Paris in 2005. This was a really interesting exhibition um, by an artist by the name of Alexis Pesquin. 
And here he was talking, which was making the similarity between how many African-American males uh, face a lot of the challenges with the police department. Here a man, and what you're seeing here, the silver part that you see are actually nails. And they're raised and leveled and some are um, compressed in order to create images of people that make it a 3D image. And they're very beautiful as well. But he was talking about a lot of the stop and frisks that many African-American men and Latinos experience here also. Um, this one he was talking about in the background, you see a RoboCop, and you see the French bread in his hand, but behind that you see IDs. And Alexei, being of African descent, his mother's from Brazil and his father's um, French, was talking a lot about how you're stopped and frisked and asked for your ID. So in the background are several IDs of many of his friends um, that he reproduced in the background of the piece. We also did an exhibition on Yoruba culture as well. And we have so many different audiences that come to the museum. Each um, exhibition gives us an opportunity to bring a new audience. And this one was focused on the beautiful concept of love. And it was an incredible showing um, of that as well. And also to bring Yoruba practices to the museum, which is an African religion that has been preserved in many ways throughout South America and Central America, but is also being realized and practiced in the United States at this time. We also brought Dred Scott, Welcome to America, here to the museum. This was one of our most controversial exhibitions. This, one, this piece is titled, Imagine a World Without America. Um, and this piece is actually the one that got us in a lot of trouble. I don't know if many of you remember this one. This was actually um, inspired by the Amadou Diallo shooting. So what you have here are silhouettes of uh, target practice at a shooting range for a police department. And he has manufactured arms that are holding different things from a squeegee to a toy gun, to three musketeer bar, keys, and he has the date at the top of when an African-American male was um, killed um, holding one of these things by the police department. In front, you have a coffin that has batons on it. And what was happening during the exhibition is that the batons were constantly banging on the coffin. And the reason why he did that was because he wanted to show that even after the person has been um, killed by the police department in a court of law, they're not allowed to rest in peace in the same way because they have to make up all kinds of stories in terms of they didn't finish school, they were an immigrant, they had been arrested before, all these different types of things which signified the batons beating on the coffin. And so the Daily News did a piece on it and they brought in Pat Lynch of the Patrolman Benevolence Association and he did a big tirade about how the museum should be closed and he got many police officers upset and everyone was like, you're like the Brooklyn Museum with sensation. And I was like, no, it's not the same kind of thing and they wanted to protest and they called all the different agencies to revoke money from the museum for this particular piece. But the difference with sensation that I was explaining to everyone is that People being angry that actually have guns is a whole nother ball game from the Sensation Exhibition. So they started these police blogs where they would talk and rant about um, this particular exhibition and um, why it should be closed down and not such nice language. Um, this one is a piece, it was a video still, I know we have limited time, but it was a video still where he was basically showing that the FBI soon after 9-11 had happened, um, how many um, Arab Americans, uh, people of the Muslim faith, were detained. And he actually was able to find these tapes in terms of um, people. There was a T-shirt that was hanging in the FBI office with a shirt, a T-shirt that said, um, welcome to America, these colors don't run. And people that were detained, their face was smashed, as you see, into the wall um, as they were detained um, during that particular time. And what he did was that he had his son, who was about five years old, over the stills over what was happening, um, say the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, this one is a piece that he put up as a result of a shooting that happened in the public housing. Um, I believe it was the Farragut houses very near his home and there was a shooting by the police department and he created these signs and took down the yield signs and put these up all over throughout the neighborhood. They stayed up for about eight hours but they brought a lot of attention um, to that particular case and it really empowered the community in many ways. This exhibition is the I Am A Man which I was thrilled about 
what I did for this exhibition was, it was taken actually from the 1968 sanitation worker strike where Martin Luther King was assassinated. And I actually replaced the signs where those sanitation workers were holding that said, I am a man, and turned them into t-shirts. And I had different men throughout New York City come and have their photograph taken. I then superimposed the image and we gave them out um, throughout the exhibition to um, African American men. And so in the back you see the 1968 version and in the front you see the 2008-2009 version combined. So it was really a way of creating a legacy but also um, to do an exhibition um, in celebration of that sanitation worker strike as well as um, issues that are pertaining to men of African descent. So these are more images from the show. We also did an exhibition called Perspectives, Women, Art, and Islam. So you're getting a real uh, understanding of the diversity of the museum. This particular piece was quite controversial. What it really talked about was this is a prayer rug, and she talked about now that she's in the West, that she feels a little bit impure praying on her prayer mat because she likes to put on her high heel shoes and go out to the club now. So she created this particular piece in terms of the ways of talking about how to, uh, I guess, juxtapose your American uh, lifestyle with your um, Islamic background and how the, the, the duality of the complexities that arise um, throughout that process. And They Won't Budge, Africans in Europe, which was curated by NYU, was talking about the migration of African people to the continent of Europe and a lot of the challenges that they're facing um, through that process. Many of the same issues that African Americans are facing in the United States are many of the issues that Africans um, abroad in Europe are facing as well, too. And this was an exhibition that was um, inspired again by NYU and brought to the museum. This also was a hotbed exhibition. Um, it was interesting to, to hear another take on it, The Gentrification of Brooklyn, The Pink Elephant Speaks. So we wanted to do an exhibition where a museum of the African diaspora, but we basically recognize that um, to do a lot of the exhibitions, we recognize all people to be of African descent. So this particular exhibition focused a lot about um, issues of gentrification. We posted these, these um, outdoor, um, how would you say, non-permissionally placed murals um, were done by Gabriel Reese, also known as Spectre. I'm not sure if you're aware of him. And we wanted to do these as promotional pieces to get people to come to the museum. And it was so exciting because at that time, Atlantic Yards and the battle for the Atlantic Yards and Build, Don't Destroy and all of these developments were coming up. And people really gravitated towards these murals and started to use them as part of their campaigns. Um, this one is a nightmare on um, Atlantic Avenue. And this one is um, unaffordable groceries. So talking about with a lot of the new grocery stores that are opening, how many people can't afford to shop in them. This one was also a very controversial one as well too, um, the Caucasian invasion. It didn't stay up for very long. Um, Basically, it, it, was, it started a lot of conversations in terms of how many um, African Americans and Latinos see white people moving into their neighborhood and how they feel about it and the complexities that um, come about at it. And what was exciting for me was that people had real dialogue and real conversation. And in terms of building and creating intelligence and intelligent conversation, I believe that intelligent conversation is built and created when you have the greatest amount of diversity in the room, economically, gender-wise, age, all of that. So this exhibition was a success for me because it did all of that. This exhibition, Ain't I a Woman, was uh, inspired primarily by Sojourner Truth's Ain't I a Woman speech, where she was talking in many ways about uh, being an African-American woman and understanding her rights and role as a woman um, in America. Reimagining Haiti, Le Project Nouveau, was curated by Chante Cozier, my partner here, and it was a, a wonderful exhibition that's also at the United Nations right now. This particular piece I thought was just fantastic because it was talking about reimagining Haiti shortly after the earthquake, and this particular piece is talking about children ultimately being responsible at the end of the day for the rebuilding and the reimagining of Haiti. 
I love this particular piece. Um, this is um, by students. So in our exhibitions, we also include students into our exhibitions, into our adult exhibitions. So this is work that they actually recreated, um, reimagining Haiti in 2079, I believe. And so each of the students created their own 3D work, which was absolutely beautiful and phenomenal. And they participate in the artist talk. They come to the opening, and they're really a part of the whole dynamic of the exhibition. This project is called Project Soft House, um, which is a project that we helped fundraise for during the exhibition, which are basically um, non-permanent but sustainable housing. Um, Rodney Leon, who's an architect that works with us, they are able to create houses and they're working to create houses where they can build a structure in two hours that is uh, very safe for people to live in um, following things like an earthquake or a tornado. And we help them to raise money in order to create these sustainable houses. I believe that they are um, in Haiti right now. Many of them have been built and are being sustained in Haiti. And we hope this becomes a model in the future um, for sustainable living. This is some of our children's programs from Brooklyn, to, from Africa to Brooklyn, from great to great. And this one is saying no, reconciling spirituality and resistance in indigenous art. This was a phenomenal exhibition to be connected with Australia and to have Australian artists come to the museum. It was really a phenomenal experience and the exhibition just left. Very quickly, these are actually called Hopi caps at the bottom and they weigh about 15 pounds and they're actually plastered on your head after someone dies. And you wear this for about four to six months or however long it takes for you to grieve and after you finish the grieving process, these caps are removed and then placed on the person's um, grave site. So it's just interesting to see how other people mourn um, in their different process. Now this one is Feed Your Head, the African Origins of the Scientific Aesthetic, which is an exhibition on African um, mathematics and geometry and Adinkra symbols. And this is our exhibition at our current space. So I hope that you will definitely come by to see it. Pixelating Black in New Dimensions, also an exhibition that's by our fellows. We have curatorial fellows who've just graduated from college who are given opportunities to curate in our space. Now, in, in terms of thinking about the theme of today, we are actually a museum that's growing and developing. So we're getting to the better stage. So I wanted to talk a little bit about better in the context of the museum. This was our original space located on Stuyvesant Avenue between Jefferson and Hancock. It was a four-story walk-up. It was in a brownstone over a Head Start program that a church owned. Wasn't the most ideal space, but it was a fantastic space that gave us an opportunity to get started. So that's that particular space, it was located in Bedford-Stuyvesant. Then we had the opportunity to move to the James E. Davis 80 Arts Building in downtown Brooklyn, which was the vision of Harvey Lichtenstein to create a cultural district in the Fort Greene neighborhood. So this was the space that was originally presented to us, and it required a whole lot of imagination and about a half a million dollars that we had to raise to do the renovations. And that's the space today. So I'm very happy and pleased with our new space, which is located downtown Brooklyn. But now this are coming up, are images of what our new building is going to look like. So we're in the process right now of looking to develop a new museum within the next four years. So I'm very excited about the opportunity to grow and build and become a larger institution, serving more and reaching more people. But now redefining better. This is the part that I'm really excited about. Although we've really grown and developed and we're looking forward to a new building and all of these exciting things, one thing that's always been on my mind is how can we actually reach audiences most in need? When you look at many communities throughout New York City, there's a lot of growth and development. But the main challenge that people are experiencing is the public housing um, dilemma. How do you build sustainable communities within the structures of public housing developments still existing within New York City? I think it's fantastic, um, particularly for people of African descent and all low-income people, that public housing was built within our urban cities versus how they did it in Europe, where they built them in the outskirts and in the suburbs, where the people have very little access to resources. But what I was thinking about is we have three major public housing developments in Fort Greene. You have Walt Whitman, Ingersoll, and Farragut. But they seem to be this big challenge in terms of what are we going to do about the public housing now that we want to have our great, pristine, beautiful new community? What are we going to do about it? 
So I started thinking about how can we do more things in order to improve the conditions um, within public housing to make it not the same hotbed issue or dilemma. And I thought about this idea, a small idea, but something that I'm more excited about in terms of how to fully develop this. And this is to start to do public programming, not to bring them to the museum, but to do public pro programming right within the heart, um, to do public programming right in the heart of uh, the Walt Whitman, Ingersoll, and Farragut houses. So as you're seeing here, what we decided to do, we decided to go into the Ingersoll houses and to do a, and the Walt Whitman, and to do a concert with the Grammy Award winning group Les Nubians. Now as simple as that may seem, a concert had never taken place in public housing within any of those complexes. There's no public programming, there's no events, and there is more paperwork than the law should allow for your ability to do that in terms of insurance documents and all those sorts of things. So I just so happened to go to a fundraiser and I just so happened to meet the president of NYCHA. And he said, I'm the president of NYCHA, my name is so and so. I said, you're the president of NYCHA, New York City Housing Authority, what does that mean? And he said like, all the public housing you see in all the five boroughs, all those thousands of buildings, that's my job. And I was like, well, I wanna have a concert there. And I was so fortunate that I met him that we were able to make that happen. But then people were saying like, Les Nubians performing, don't they sing in French? Why would the audience be like all into this? Do you think this is gonna be a success? So what we decided to do is we decided to bring children um, to perform as well too. So local school groups, local dance companies, they decided to perform as well. But there were a lot of issues in terms of police security, public housing security, local elected officials. Everyone had to be brought involved in this. And I wanted to do it as a late night concert. There were like no dice on that. You can have the event from two to seven. When it gets dark, everyone has to be out. So there are a lot of constraints in that way as well. But I thought that this was so dynamic because a lot of the people in the community um, in this particular complex had not had face painting done in their neighborhood. So we were able to do that and to actually create that environment as well. We, were, we put balloons up all over the place. We made it like a really very festive event for the whole community to come out and come out to enjoy as a family. And it was really a very moving experience um, for me as well. But even in the process of giving out the flyers, which was also very moving, a lot of people said that they were not going to come to that particular event because they thought it was gonna be dangerous. Um, some, uh, an older woman said like, I'm not coming out there, those young people got guns and I only have a switchblade and I can't run that fast. So it was all these different things in terms of challenges, in terms of why people thought they weren't gonna come. But a lot of the men that were in the neighborhood did say that they were gonna come and they were gonna make sure that it was gonna be a safe environment. Um, so here are some of the children and the families enjoying themselves at this particular event. And I was very nervous, to be honest with you, in terms of was this gonna be a success. Um, someone, a young man had told me when I was preparing, he said, it's like, it's really a nice thing that you wanna do, but he said, I have to be honest with you. Sometimes some people just don't want other people to have a good time, and you should be conscious of that. So I was like, okay, but we're still going along with it. And then the housing police came and they said, we're gonna make sure that there are police officers on the roof of every building in the, in the complex. So I was like, oh my God, like this is becoming a really big thing in terms of all of this. So my heart was like, I don't even know where it was at this time because I'm really hoping that everything goes well. Um, but slowly but surely people started to come out um, slowly but surely, we started to have dance performances. This is the Creative Outlet Dance Company. Um, this right here, I was showing um, Shantae, the woman in the yellow. You wouldn't believe it, but she was the security for the event. And so everybody at the, at the event said, if you want security at the event, Pat is the person. She will make sure that your event goes smoothly and that there are no problems at your particular event. And she was very serious and real about that. So I was happy to have her as well too. It's basically a way of making sure. But the other thing that was really dynamic is that you're not only doing an event in public housing, because you're bringing the Grammy Award winning Les Nubians into the neighborhood, you're bringing people from all other neighborhoods into the neighborhood as well too. And what happens in neighborhoods like within public housing, there's a brain drain in terms of all the talented people that make it leave and don't come back and other people um, 
that go on to receive higher levels of education or go on to do other things in their life don't come back to this community or socialize or interact in any meaningful way. So this was a way to bring other people back into the community um, in order to participate in events and programming. Uh, this is another youth group that performed um, at the event. Another youth group that performed from one of the local churches. Um, this is on the left, the Tenant Association President, Ed Brown, and this is um, Gigi Elliott, the Chief of Staff for Councilwoman Letitia James. More people that were at the event enjoying it. And it really started to fill up um, with people throughout the event. And I was really very happy. This was Lay Nubians performing that people just loved. It was a nine-piece band, which was phenomenal. Um, this is Brenda Brunson Bay, who owns a clothing and fashion store in the area. And I was just so impressed with the amount and the number of people that came um, for this particular event and how the community embraced it. I think that, for me, it really served as an example of um, making the hard decision and doing the thing that's hardest, doing the thing that's most riskiest, and it has ultimately the most reward. And it was such an empowering feeling to have all of these people um, come out from the neighborhoods, people that found the courage to come. It was like people were kind of feeling trapped in a place of fear, but all of a sudden with the music and the excitement and the children and the activity, it became like an entirely new community. And what's so also phenomenal is that public housing is a phenomenal place for programming. And so when I think about improving upon ideas or um, improving upon better, um, in, in discussions of the theme today, I certainly think that how we address public housing and how we go directly into public housing, how do we provide resources for the communities that are most in need, and I think that what I came away with from that experience is that it's most um, prominent to go right directly into the source. And so it was a very powerful and enlightening experience for me. And I think that um, as we continue to develop communities and continue to develop with each other, that it's very important for us to look at communities most in need and how can we actually balance and level the playing field. Because as Bob Marley says, when it rains, it doesn't rain on one man's house. And we have to figure out how to bring that level of equality throughout. So thank you very much. I enjoyed my presentation.